I wish I could sing or dance or really entertain you. Uh, you know, unless you're Bono or Annie Lennox or even Bill Clinton, talking about HIV can be a difficult thing to get people really excited about, and talking about children with HIV can be even harder. If only I were Angelina Jolie or Oprah Winfrey, but no, I'm not. I'm just me, no star power here, no, no fanfare, just a person hoping to educate and inspire another about a topic that I think is really important. Mother Teresa says, we do no great things, only small things with great love. So this talk is a small thing, but I do do it with great love. So when I tell people that I work with children in, with HIV, often I sense a pause, something that suggests to me that children and HIV is not something that most people really think about or want to think about, which is understandable. Most people don't like to think about children suffering, but I think it's more than that. HIV has become associated with groups that are marginalized in our society. Homosexuals, drug users, sex workers. If you're not familiar with that term, I'm talking about prostitutes. Also, HIV disproportionately affects minorities and the poor. So it's easy for us to distance ourselves from the problem after all, if we think it, does, it doesn't affect us and we don't have to worry about, and there are plenty of other things to worry about. And it's even easier with HIV because we can blame the person for contracting the disease because this is, after all, largely a behavioral disease. But when we think about blaming young people, particularly children with HIV, I think it's a little harder for people. Not only, obviously, children who are born with HIV, it's just ridiculous to blame them, but even a young person, say a 15-year-old who contracts HIV from sexual behavior, it's a little harder for people to be as blaming. And so I think that creates some cognitive dissonance, which I actually think is a good thing. So when I was 23 years old, it was 1992. This was the year uh, Bill Clinton was elected president. Someone very close to me, only 23 at the time, was diagnosed with HIV. And at that time, HIV was a very young disease, discrimination was very high, and it was still, for all practical purposes, considered a death sentence. AZT was the only drug available on the market to treat HIV, and as many of you probably remember, HIV originally was thought to target only gay men and was referred to as the gay plague or gay-related immune deficiency. And this is the title of a New York Times article published shortly after the first AIDS cases emerged. So much has changed since then, which is great. Some things have not. Uh, currently, it's estimated that there are 2.5 million new HIV infections each year 50,000 of those are in the United States, and it's estimated that between one and four are adolescents between the ages of 13 and 24. So currently, I work as a psychology professor, and I've spent the better part of the past two decades, beginning in graduate school, studying pediatric HIV. And I've also had the good fortune of being part of a medical team that provides services to children and young people with HIV from birth to age 24. Now, some of you might be asking yourself, 24, I thought we were talking about pediatrics. This is because uh, there's some controversy in the field of developmental psychology about whether or not something really as magical is happening at the 18th birthday when we are legally adults. And there's a recognition that this age range between 18 and 21, or sometimes 18 and 24, we're not quite yet adults, but we're no longer adolescents. So it's not uncommon in pediatrics to see this age range from birth to 21 or birth to 24. So today I really want to talk to you, uh, I want to share some stories with you. Uh, I'll call these my imaginary friends because these aren't real cases, but they are based on aspects of all of the young people that I've worked with over the years as a researcher or as a clinician. So I'm going to start with George. So George is nine years old and in the fourth grade. His favorite things in the world are fishing and playing football. He has some learning delays, but otherwise he's a pretty happy-go-lucky kid. Unbeknownst to George, George was born to an HIV-infected mother who died shortly after his birth. He was sent to live with his father and his father's wife, who, again, unbeknownst to him, adopted him. They've since had a child, George's sister. George has been going to the doctor since he was a baby, 
and he's been taking medication every day since he was three years old, originally through a G-port, which is a surgically created opening in the stomach. Now, George doesn't know he's HIV positive. His parents have told him he has sickle cell disease. They're afraid because to tell George about his disease means also to tell him that he's adopted and that his biological mother is dead. Now, Carly, on the other hand, is 11 years old and in the sixth grade. She loves to draw and to sing. She's very athletic. She hopes to join her school's volleyball team. Like George, Carly was born to an HIV-infected mother, although her mother is still alive. Like George, she doesn't know she's living with HIV. Her mother is afraid to tell her she's been lying to her about the disease affecting both of them. Now, both George and Carly's parents also are afraid that others at school and in the community will learn that their family is affected by HIV. And they're afraid of public disclosure because they fear rejection, they fear isolation, and they fear discrimination. Now, Carly's doctors have told her mother that they will disclose to Carly her status if she hasn't by her 13th birthday. The American Academy of Pediatrics allows for this because they believe children have a right to know. And beyond having a right to know, we know that the more meaningfully involved people are in their medical treatment, the better the outcomes, and this also is true for children. Beyond that, we know that as children age into adolescence, that this becomes a public health concern because we know that adolescence, it is typical, is, is a normal time for sexual exploration. So after much angst and deliberation and conversations with Carly's doctor, her, her mother sits her down and breaks the news. And the conversation goes something like this. This is not your fault. You were born with this disease. There's absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. But whatever you do, don't tell anyone. Meanwhile, George's parents just can't bring themselves to tell him. But George, like many kids his age, is curious and a lot smarter than we give young people credit for. And he's starting to question what his parents have told him about sickle cell disease. So one day, he decides to look up on the internet the name on the outside of one of his pill bottles. When he confronts his parents, they have no choice but to tell him everything, and the conversation goes something like this. You were born with this disease. There's absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. This is not your fault, but whatever you do, don't tell anyone. So George and Carly are left to try to make sense of this information without any real support other than their parents, right? Friends, friends and family are not rallying around to provide support. Nobody's organizing a fundraising benefit in their honor in the community because nobody knows. Now, Shari, on the other hand, is 16 and in the 11th grade. She hopes to get her driver's license soon. Like many teenagers, she likes to hang out with her friends, and she's thinking about her future. Now, because Shari lives in a state that receives federal funding for health education, she's being taught in school that she should abstain from having sex until she's married. Oops. Shari, like many of her peers, is already sexually active. She's only had one sexual partner, but she decides she wants to be tested for HIV. But she's afraid to tell her mom because her mom doesn't know she's having sex. Plus, her mother is a single mother, raising four kids, working two jobs. She doesn't have a lot of time for Shari. But Shari lives in a state that allows minors age 13 and older to be tested and treated for HIV without parental consent. So she gets tested, and much to her surprise and disappointment, is infected with HIV. She begins medical treatment, and her doctors are helping her try to secure some funding for her medical treatment. When she's approached about participating in a clinical trial, they're testing a new drug for HIV. The clinical trial would pay for her medical care and also would provide her with a small stipend to compensate her for her time. So Shari desperately wants to enroll. She needs the money. She needs her medical care paid for. She hopes the treatment will work. And beyond all of this, she just thinks it might be really cool to participate in medical science in this way. But because she's a minor, she can't enroll without parental consent. And remember, her mom doesn't even know she's infected. So she can be tested and treated, 
but she can't be a research participant without parental consent. Last case, Jose. Jose is a waiter. He's attending technical school. He was diagnosed with HIV when he was 15 years old and had been receiving treatment from a pediatric provider until he turned 21 a few months ago. Because of his age, he can no longer be seen in a pediatric setting, and also because of his age, he's no longer eligible for the funding he once received to pay for his medical care. Now, like Shari, he's approached about participating in a medical trial, but Jose doesn't trust medical science. He remembers hearing the story about the syphilis study in the 40s where the government knowingly infected people so they could test the effectiveness of its treatment. He's told things have changed, and that can't happen to human research participants anymore, but he's not taking any chances. Now, the cost of Jose's medical treatment is about $2,100 per month. So he has no choice but to stop taking his medication, and he begins to wonder if he'll die from this disease, even though we know how to treat it. And like many young people with HIV, he begins to experience symptoms of anxiety and depression. Now, I think it's important to say that all of these young people are much more alike than they are different from their peers, right? Depending on their age, they laugh, they play, they go to school or they go to work, they have family and friends, they are or will enter intimate relationships, they're thinking about their future, but they face some really unique challenges, challenges that could be made easier if we were a kinder, gentler, less judgmental society. So I want to share a few things. These are some things I'm kind of talking on behalf of my friends here, things that they would want you to know. The first thing that my young friends would want you to know, and this is great news, is that we know how to prevent mother-to-child transmission of HIV. We know that pregnant women who are treated with HIV are significantly less likely to acquire the virus. And in the United States, where maternal outreach efforts have been high, and laws have been passed to ensure that pregnant women are tested for HIV, we've seen a dramatic reduction in perinatal cases. In fact, currently it's estimated that only 2% of babies born to HIV-infected mothers in this country will acquire the virus. But this isn't the case everywhere. In many low- to middle-income countries, where resources, and by resources I mean funding, is low, uh, such programs don't exist. So on the continent of Africa, it's estimated that 40% of babies born to HIV-infected mothers will acquire the virus. So we know how to eradicate perinatal transmission of HIV, but it's not happening. So my young friends would want you to share this information in support of maternal outreach to ensure that women are, pregnant women are tested with HIV worldwide. This is the best prevention that we have in the area of HIV. There really is no reason for babies to be born with HIV. My young friends would probably want you to know that despite great medical advances in this area, and the medical advances are great, we know how to treat HIV. We know that with appropriate treatment, HIV can be managed as a chronic condition as opposed to a life-threatening illness. But the problem is, is that many of the people most in need of this treatment don't have access to it. So on behalf of my young friends, <laughs> I would say, uh, hopefully we can share in their enthusiasm that they might now have access to medical care in this country, and that I think we should believe that it is their right to have medical care. My young friends would want you to know that despite the promising, very promising cases that we read about in the media about a cure for AIDS, recently there was a baby who's thought to be cured, that Currently, there still is no reliable cure for AIDS, nor do we have an HIV vaccine, although the research is being done in that area. And funding for HIV research is still needed and is very worthwhile. And not only do we need to continue to fund medical research in the area of HIV, but also social behavioral research, because this is, after all, in large part a behavioral disease. And what we're learning about HIV as a behavioral disease and how to prevent it and treat it will be helpful for a variety of other behavioral diseases that we're currently faced with as a society and will be in the future. Some might argue that most diseases are, in some sense of or another, behavioral diseases. Also, 
the young people that I work with want you to know that some minors do want to participate in HIV medical and social behavioral research. And they encourage us to consider what it means to protect minors as a vulnerable population. And at the very least, to find some balance between overprotection and underprotection, because overprotection impedes our respect for individual autonomy in a developmentally appropriate way. And lastly, on the topic of research, on behalf of uh, the young people that I've worked with, I would say we need to continue to demand that research be conducted in an ethically and socially responsible manner, not just in this country, but worldwide, because science depends on the public's trust. So we've made great strides in this country in ensuring that research is conducted ethically, uh, and that needs to be spread worldwide. My young friends want you to support their desire and their right to comprehensive sexuality education. The abstain until marriage message, while maybe ideal, believe me, I have an 11-year-old son, I love the message, simply is not realistic if for no other reason that marriage rates are on the decline and people who are getting married on average are getting married later. Not to mention that until very recently, marriage hasn't been afforded to all members of our society. So, comprehensive sexuality education is extremely important, and it is not a form, you know, teaching young people how to protect themselves and others from unwanted disease and pregnancy is not a form of moral corruption. My young friends want you to know that HIV stigma is one of the main obstacles to HIV prevention, care, and treatment. It was not that long ago that Ryan White or the Rays brothers, all infected with HIV, were expelled from school, that the Rays' home was burned down after a federal judge demanded their return to school. So young people are afraid. And while they are protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act, they're afraid to even tell their schools. So we have to shift this stigma so that these young people, and all people, I would say, living with HIV, feel free to be open about their disease. My young friends want you to understand the subtle yet important distinction between privacy and secrecy. So while privacy seems like a personal choice, secrecy seems imposed by fear. So these young people keep their disease a secret because they fear society's response. And what they hope for is that we can allow them to live in the open with HIV with the same compassion and support and resources that are extended to anyone living with a life-threatening or chronic disease, regardless of age or race or ethnicity or socioeconomic status, and regardless of how the disease was acquired. Because the 15-year-old who acquires HIV from sexual behavior is no less worthy of our compassion than the baby that was born with it. My young friends simply want you to care about them and to continue to care about this disease and its impact in this country and worldwide. So in closing, I challenge you to help be part of creating a world where people with HIV can live in the open without discrimination, a world where we don't allow our fears, our fear of illness, our fear of others who we perceive to be different from us, where we don't allow our fears and our judgment and our apathy to be stronger than our compassion. Thank you.